Because what we're learning throughout this entire study is God's word, God's Bible here is one story through one family. It's right. So we're following this family. We're going to really see that as we go through here into the book of Ju- uh, Ruth, uh, coming out of Judges where we're at today. We're going to do the first two chapters of Ruth, Lord willing, um, and then probably finish it up next week. But we're learning here how this whole family line, and we're seeing this family from all unexpected ways God is tying them together to come through with this plan. And the plan was to send humanity Messiah, which was God himself coming down in the flesh, Jesus Christ. Yeshua HaMashiach is his Hebrew name. Sometimes we've heard to do it, but Jesus is being the, he's the Messiah. And that's the whole story here. And we're learning that Jesus Christ uh, is in the Old Testament, right? He's not a new thing in the New Testament, although it, he appears, you know, brand new in, in a way. But he's always been in the Old Testament, sometimes referred to as the angel of the Lord. Uh, he is the second person of the Trinity. And because Jesus is God, God is before space and time. So we know that Jesus had to be out there somewhere, right? He wasn't just, you know, sitting in the background of the scenes. He's actively involved, we're learning. And we're seeing that even through our Bible study here. Every book you look in, including the Old Testament, the 39 books of the Old Testament, Jesus is in there and you can find them. And that's what we're doing here. So we did, uh, you know, months ago, we did the uh, first five books, the books of Moses. That, again, laid the story. Genesis has 2,500 years of history. That gave us the beginning of how this creation got to be in a pretty fast run through. We learned about the family a little bit there. That's what we learned about, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It really got into that after the three rebellions we learned about. Um, that The last one was the Tower of Babel. That's where it split up all the nations, and that's kind of the premise of this. We learned that all in the book of Genesis. And then the other four books of Moses, Exodus through Deuteronomy, we were learning about how Israel became a nation coming out of Egypt um, and going into the Promised Land. And then we got to where we're at right now, the history books. And the history books, there's 12 of them. Uh, we kind of, it's like our library category would be on the history shelf here. It goes all the way from Joshua to Esther. There's 12 books. And I said it comes in about three sections. You can break it up into three more sections. Joshua, Judges, and Ruth, which we'll have those three books finished, hopefully again by next week. That's uh, the time period of the Judges or before there were any kings. Joshua, you know, that he was technically a leader. Uh, judges is more where they're kind of being risen up, but there was no kingdom. And then the books of Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles, we see the kingdom come in and how dysfunctional it was and how humanity couldn't get it right because they're doing it their own way without God. Israel was screwing it up. And then Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, after they came back from Babylon, remember it looked like it's completely over. We'll get to that in the books of history, but it looked like it was completely over and done with when Babylon came and crushed Jerusalem. Uh, but Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther are books of hope and God allowing Israel to come back to the nation through Cyrus, a cool prophecy that, again, we know that prophecy is possible because God is outside of space and time. He could see the future, knew that Cyrus was going to come from Persia, and he even names him. Cyrus and Josiah are two people named in prophecy ahead of time uh, to kind of prove that God already had this plan. So even the things that are bad in your life, if you're a true believer, the things that are negative weighing you down, we know that God has ordained them and let them through for a reason, for your benefit, and there's hope to come. So that's where we're at right now. We're going to uh, jump into uh, Ruth, but we'll just kind of recap Joshua and Judges and how we got to the book of Ruth here. So Joshua, you remember, this is the first book of history, and this is when they came into the promised land. Uh, the reason I bring up Joshua is, uh, one, because it was it's the beginning of the history books, but two, the story of Rahab really comes in here. If you remember in Joshua chapter two, there was the story of Rahab, and we're going to learn later that Boaz is actually the son of Rahab. So you can see the connection there with Rahab, and you'll see later with Ruth that this is the connection of God's family. But it started in Joshua with Rahab and Joshua 2. Then we learned about you know, them crossing the Jordan River. And then we learned before the Battle of Jericho, before any of the battles in the land of Canaan happened, Joshua ran into the real Joshua. And the reason I say that is because Jesus' name is also Joshua. Joshua is another name for Jesus, just like we have, you know, Jose and all these other names, they all mean Juan and John, they mean the same thing, just different names. So Joshua actually is the same name for Jesus, or Yeshua, it's the same kind of thing. So Joshua met Joshua, meaning Jesus Christ, pre-incarnate as the angel of the Lord. And that was to let him know that there was going to be a spiritual war going on, and the Lord was going to win the battles, really, right? And that's why Jericho, they walk around the whole, you know, they win the battle just by marching around this building. That's a pretty evident sign that God was with them. They won in a miraculous way. And that was because Jesus Christ showed up and said, hey, listen, I'm going to do all the fighting. You just trust in me and you follow what I say and you'll be good. So, again, it was Jesus Christ showing up, praying hard to let us know that in the spirit world, that's where everything happens. That's why prayer and our Bibles are so important. 
knowing God's word and his promises help us know what the truth is and help us know how to act on it. And then prayer is how we can actually interact into the battlefield uh, of what's going on in the spiritual realm. Otherwise, we, can't, we know that we can't see or touch spirits, right? We know that. So the only way to access this is through prayer and knowing that the Lord will ultimately fight our battles. We just need to ask him for help is what the Bible says. So that's the book of Joshua, which led us into the book of Judges, which we finished up last week. So we're going to do a nice quick run through again of just what happened in the book of Judges and this terrible spiral pattern that kept happening. Remember the sin and oppression, repentance, deliverance, and peace. It kept going over and over and over again. Um, and we can say that we think we'd be better than the Israelites, but unfortunately, humanity is the same. At some point, it goes bad, we learn, from peace and prosperity, even though they know the history. Uh, unfortunately, they say, uh, those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. Those who know history are doomed to suffer through it while everybody else doesn't know what's going on, right? So even if you know history, you know that humanity has fallen as a system, and you're going to watch these terrible things. That's what the prophets had to do. Even Jeremiah, that's why he's the weeping prophet. Jeremiah cried, and he weeped because he knew what was going to come. He knew God's truth, and he saw everybody else just being oblivious and not listening, or not even being oblivious, but just disregarding what God said. And that's what we see in our society, right? That's why we can be sad. We know what's going to come when you go and do these ungodly things and lead nations in ungodly ways, uh, but we have to unfortunately live through it because sometimes evil leaders get in charge, right? So the book of Judges starts out, and it just kind of starts with the spiral. We're going to start to see different names, uh, but the same patterns. We saw Othniel. He was our first judge, and he actually was introduced in the book of Joshua, and we see this, uh, how they kind of connected and tied the books together. Back then, they didn't have a nice little Bible. They just had these scrolls, so this kind of tied the scrolls together. The story of Othniel was in the book of Joshua, so we know that it's kind of you know, tied right into that story there. Um, so Othniel was a judge. He led them out of Mesopotamia. And then the second judge we learned about was Ehud. Remember, he was the left-handed guy. You know, he, had, he, he used the dagger, killed the fat King Eglon. And the reason that's important is King Eglon was king of Moab, right? And Moab was the group that was used to oppress Israel. And we're going to learn in the book of Ruth, Moab is an important place. That's where they're going to go. That's where Ruth's from. So we're going to learn a lot about Moab, and we're going to see what's really going on here and how everything's tied together, why problems occur, and kind of what's going on. But we saw that they were actually oppressed under Moab, and Ehud brought them out. And then we learned about Deborah. There was no uh, honorable, godly men. So Deborah was the leader. She used to roll under a tree, it would say. And she was the leader there. And Barak was kind of her, her guy that she used as, a, as her somewhat of a general to lead. But they ended up uh, taking out the Canaanites, it says. Um, and they had 40 years of rest. Then we got into Gideon. He was the next major judge. And remember, he was just a feeble young guy, uh, you know, threshing down, hiding out because of the Midianites. They were, remember, they would come in and they would steal everything that Israel would do. I said, like, imagine preparing a meal and then somebody comes in and eats it off your table and you have nothing. You're starving. That's how Israel was. When the harvest would come, they'd work all year round to do the harvest. And then the Midianites, their oppressors, would come in and glean and steal all of their hard work and Israel would be starving. So Gideon was hiding out. That's what they would do. Try to hide out to, you know, keep their food safe so they could feed their nation. And that's when... He had an alien encounter with Jesus Christ, pre-incarnate, right? This is where Jesus showed up in this book here in Judges 6, shows up to Gideon and tells him that he's going to use him to save Israel and do something mighty. And Gideon was so surprised because he was this little puny guy from a small clan, and he said, I'm, you know, I'm useless, God. I think you got the wrong guy. He was very confused. But what this teaches us is the pattern that we're seeing in the Bible. Again, the Bible is full of patterns that happen over and over and over again, which means they're happening today. And we got to look in our world and our lives at how are these spiral patterns happening today. And Gideon, again, was a guy that would have never guessed to be used by God. He would have never thought because he didn't have any skill, any talent. He didn't think he was anything great. And that's who God chose. So anybody who thinks they don't have any skills or they don't have anything going for them, you're the perfect candidate, I would say, for God to show up and appear in your life and to call you. He doesn't, he doesn't equip you first and call you. He calls you and then he equips you. And that's what happened with Gideon here. Gideon was not a general. He's not a leader by any means. But God called him first and said, I will equip you because God can do anything. So he called Gideon. Remember, Gideon put him through a bunch of signs of the fleece and all that. Uh, but God came through. Uh, this is where the real battle of 300 happened. God used 300 men to defeat, you know, thousands of other men. More trickery, kind of like in Jericho. Uh, they surrounded him in the dark. It made it sound like there was millions of them. There's only 300. And Gideon was able to win. But then we saw something very, a very valuable lesson where Gideon kind of got prideful. He created an ephod which was supposed to be for the Levites. He wasn't supposed to have that. He had them bringing him all of his gold. And he even had a son named Abimelech, which means my father is king, right? 
So that is not really uh, the great way to go. He went from being, you know, you know, humble, saying, I'm not worthy, to this prideful person. So we have to remember that when, you know, when God calls you to start doing great things, you can't let it go to your head because you can turn right into the villain, right? Gideon was the hero, starts out the hero, and turns into somewhat of a villain at the end, we see. And that can happen to anybody if you're not staying in your Bible and you're not praying, right? The spiritual war. So the spiritual war is happening when you're working for God. The enemy is obviously going to attack you, right? That's why in war, you don't worry about the soldiers who are, you know, sleeping in the tents, right? It's the war generals who are out there on the battlefields who the enemy comes for. So the enemy came for Gideon and seemed to got into Gideon's head and the ugly sin of pride rose up there. And we saw it lead right into Abimelech. That was the next uh, section where Abimelech, it got so evil in Israel. That's what we keep learning. Israel is so evil and it was a lawless nation, basically. A nation of no laws. They did not follow God's laws. They almost disregarded them completely. We see them sitting over and over, and it got so bad that Abimelech worked with the men of Shechem to murder his 70 brothers, his brothers. But one of them got away and had this whole uh, prophecy about what was going to happen with, you know, the bramble uh, and, the, and the vineyards and, and how they chose an evil king. It was this whole display to show how they chose Abimelech for evil intention, that it was not for good reason. And then we learned about the downfall of the people in Abimelech where he went and set their tower on fire, wiped them out after three years, and then they killed him with, by a woman throwing a stone off of the top of the tower and killing him. And that was prophesied three years earlier. So another reminder, this prophecy that his demise is going to come was a three-year uh, prophecy, but for three years it actually says it was great, and they were doing awesome until Gael and all the company came through. It says God let an evil spirit through, actually. So evil spirits caused division there and caused all this chaos, but for a while it looked good. Another reminder that if you're in sin and there's no repercussions, it does not mean that God's not on his way. You know, he's slowly, he's, he's slow to anger, but it eventually comes, his wrath and his judgment comes, and it came on Abimelech there, right? It came right on Abimelech. And then we learned right after that, we went into the Jephthah, and we're getting down to our last couple of judges, so we'll be caught up. But Jephthah, he was kind of like Abimelech in a way that he had a different mother than his brothers, and maybe they knew their history well. They actually ran Jephthah out of town. He didn't do anything wrong, but they ran him out of town because he wasn't like the others. And maybe because they knew what happened last time with Abimelech, he tried to take over, he killed them all. Maybe they said, this is bad news. Let's just get rid of the guy, right? Um, so he ended up leaving, but later they were so oppressed and Israel went, was so disobedient, they needed a leader. And they thought of Jephthah and they went to him and kind of worked out a deal. And we learned about how Jephthah was foolish and how he made an uh, irrational plan to God. He's made a vow saying whatever came out of his house when he, got, when he returned, uh, from victory, he would sacrifice the Lord, and it ended up being his daughter coming out. And we talked about this in our Bible study when we got to this point, about how this was foolish for him to follow through with it. It was sad that it came to this. The problem was that he made a vow that he didn't know he could keep, and you shouldn't make promises that God you can't keep. It says it's better just to not make promises or say anything at all. Um, but we saw here that he followed through. What he should have said is, I was wrong for making the vow, God. You would never want me to kill my daughter. But instead, he was so set on following this vow that he took himself right into another sin, right? Thou shalt not kill, and only that, thou shalt not sacrifice thy own children, right? We learned that uh, the people of the ancient cultures were doing that. They were sacrificing to Malek and Kamash and all these gods, and that was the common thing. So we're seeing how Israel became very worldly. They became like the other Gentile nations to where even their leaders like Jephthah, who was, quote-unquote, their godly leader, was doing things that the Gentile gods asked for, that these evil spirits were asking for child sacrifice. And Jephthah probably assumed, you know, this is nothing new. This isn't out of the ordinary. People kill their kids all the time for sacrifice to their gods. I'll sacrifice her to Yahweh to follow through to make him happy. And I'm sure God was shaking his head, saying, come on, he's just digging deeper, right? You never want to undo a sin with a sin. That never is the answer. And Jephthah, didn't, maybe he didn't know that. He was just so oblivious, maybe, to, and this shows, again, how lawless of a nation this was. They did not regard God's law. And that's what happened with the story of Jephthah, which led us into the last major judge we had. This was Judges 13 through 16 is where we learned about Samson. Uh, Judges 13, we, we learned about how the Lord Jesus Christ, again, appeared to Manoah and his wife, first, to Manoah's wife first, and then to them both to tell that they were going to have a son, right? He prophesied and said, you're going to have a son, and he's going to be the leader. He's going to be a Nazarite, though which means he can't touch, you know, strong drink, means wine, alcohol, grapes was included in that, can't touch dead animals or dead carcasses and needs to keep his hair growing. He cannot cut his hair. And that was what he was to do. And, of course, he was born in Judges 14, Samson. Uh, he's one of the more popular judges that people know about, but they might not know his entire story. 
we went through his entire story and how it actually started out not with Delilah, but another woman. Delilah was just a pattern of Samson. We saw it was his sin, his, his sin that he was stuck in, that even though he'd get out a little bit, he'd get right back into it. And it was his eyes that got him into sin. He saw a woman from Timnah who was beautiful. And it says she was right in Samson's eyes. And we're learning in the book, we learned in the book of Judges that it is this whole thing, the whole problem was everybody was doing what was right to them what was right in their own eyes instead of saying, what does God's word say? What does God's law say? That's why I say this is a very lawless nation. Even the leaders, Samson, was like this. And he kept breaking his vows over and over again, his Nazarite vows. Uh, on the way to, to getting his, his wife from Timnah, he uh, was by a vineyard and a lion came out. And that's when, you know, the whole honey story happened. He killed the lion with his hands. Um, so he touched a dead carcass. Uh, we learned about the vines there. And then it wasn't until later on with Delilah that he cut, you know, they cut his hair, and that was the three strikes and you're out. He had violated every area of the Nazarite vow, um, but God was gracious to him. But at some point again, uh, it got bad. They plucked his eyes out, which probably no coincidence. God allowed it to be like that because Sansa's whole problem was women, beautiful women, right? He was giving in to beautiful women who were seducing him. That was his pattern. Uh, and they gouged out his eyes, and uh, we, we learned about his awful demise at the end. Uh, where he basically, it was kind of like a suicide bomber in a way, he killed the people uh, and took his own life, knowing that he was taking out the Philistines. Uh, and it says that he killed more people in his death right there when he knocked those pillars down than he did his whole life. And we learned about how he set foxes on fire, burned all the grain, killed men here, and killed mo a thousand more of the jawbones. He had committed a lot of murder against the Philistines, uh, but he killed the most uh, there. And that was, that was our last major judge we learned about. And it, see, it had gotten pretty awful. Samson, although he was their leader, uh, he was sinning and breaking all of his vows. So again, their leaders are not great leaders uh, completely. So remember in the Bible, when you see somebody do something that's not Jesus, you can, you can be sure to question it, right? Because sometimes they're going to do the right thing. A lot of times there's, you know, there's going to be some good things. But every once in a while, there's actions in there that are showing sin, right? The story of Solomon, for example, when we get to that, there, there's no reason anybody should have a thousand wives and concubines like he did. So it wasn't a good thing, but it's what Solomon did. And it's showing how even the leaders, godly leaders that God would call could still be sinful, right? So we shouldn't set man as our standard. We should set God, Jesus Christ, as our standard, right? That's why when you see in the Bible what Jesus did, it's safe to say that that's the right thing to do, right way to go about things. But when you see some of these other things happen, we're seeing that Jephthah, Samson, all these guys had some sin about them. And Israel was really just spiraling out of control, you could say. And then the last five chapters just kind of more focused on, it was like an addendum on the end there to kind of just show how lawless the land had become. We learned about a guy named Micah who hired a Levite, but Micah stole money from his mom. This weird story, he stole money from his mom. He gave it back to her. She blessed him because he gave her back the money that was stolen. Really bizarre situation. And then they used that silver to build basically idols to other household, other household gods. And they built a gold image to God. And that's the first two uh, commandments violated right there. They had other gods before Yahweh. And they were creating images, right? So right there, slipped right into idolatry, shows how evil it was. There was a Levite, which you can't make your own priest like this. He called a Levite, made him his own priest, and it got really bad. Judges 18, the following chapter, showed how the, the tribe of Dan, <clears throat> and then focused in on the tribe of Dan and how they were looking for more land. <clears throat> and we learned that that was sinful of them in itself. God had already, in the book of Joshua, you can see Dan already had land down there by the Philistines, right? But maybe the battle was too tough. It was, it was narrow. The land wasn't big enough. They didn't think their house, quote unquote, their house was big enough. They needed to upgrade. And they didn't want to fight down where the Philistines were. So they went all the way up to Laish, which was in the north. And they renamed it Dan. They took over. It was unsuspecting. But we learned there that they sent out five spies to find out the land was ripe to harvest. Basically, they could go in there, could kill them, take them. It wasn't going to be a fight at all. They weren't used to having battles. They didn't keep in touch with anybody, right? So they were kind of off the grid. And they made this whole plan. But in the meantime... They ran into the house of Micah in the land of Ephraim, and they found, his, they found the priest, and they found his idols. And instead of smashing them and chastising Micah and telling him to repent of what he had done, they actually took his priest and the idols with them, right? So again, bad plan. Rather than correcting the issue, they only made it worse. Now, instead of idolatry with this one man in his household, there's going to be idolatry in this whole tribe of Dan. And we learned at the end of Judges 18 that those remained there until Assyria came in and took them. So they remained there. Th that whole idolatry situation and those idols remained at Dan, the most northern part of Israel, until Assyria came and took them away. And later on, we're going to learn that uh, in the kingdom, when it got divided, there was an, in the apostasy in the north, 
they actually set a false place of worship up in Dan with idolatry. And this might play a part in it, that this was already, they had already succumbed to idolatry. It was kind of a custom there, so it wasn't really hard to get some more idolatry up there. So that was Judges 18 we learned about. And then it only spiraled out of more and more control. Judges 19, we keep seeing these patterns of Bethlehem and Judah and Ephraim. Um, and now we get into Benjamin. We're starting to see the contrast they're starting to show between Judah and Benjamin. And that has to do with what's coming up with the kingdom Bec- between you know, Saul and David. We'll learn Saul came from the tribe of Benjamin. David came from the tribe of Judah. And they're showing the contrast. But Benjamin are the villains here in this story. We learn about a Levite. And he had a woman from Bethlehem, a concubine, that he went and got. And they were traveling back through the town of Gibeah, which was Israelites. They didn't stay in the Gentile nations or the city because they wanted to stay with among Jews, you know, thought it would be safe. And an old man found him and said, hey, it ain't safe out here. You need to just come stay with me. It's not good to be out here, which reminds us a lot of Sodom, like Sodom and Gomorrah, which pretty much what this story is. Another spiral pattern. The ancient rabbis were, were very accurate when they said that everything in the Bible happens over and over and over again. So this story is not a new story if you were with us in the book of Genesis or have read it on your own of Sodom and Gomorrah. Same thing happens. Instead of angels, the two angels uh, being in the home like it was in Sodom and Gomorrah, this time it's a Levite and his concubine and a virgin daughter of this old man. Um, the men come. They want to get to the man, right? Another a situation of uh, homosexual lust for men on other men. He says, no, you shouldn't do this. And they give the concubine out, right? He's to protect them. He gives his concubine out and they end up taking advantage of her, raping her and, and basically leaving her for dead in the morning. An awful, awful story. And the Levite was so heartbroken, he took it to the extreme, put her on his donkey when she didn't answer, realizing she was probably dead, rode her home and then chopped her into 12 pieces, which sounds sadistic. And it's a pretty weird situation, but he was so distressed he wanted his outrage to be seen throughout Israel. And the reason he cut her into 12 pieces was he was going to send her to each tribe. So every tribe in Israel knew the evil that had happened in Israel, which led us right into Judges 20, which was Israel's war with Benjamin, we learned about, where Israel, the other tribes, the 11 tribes, had to create a war on Benjamin because Benjamin kind of stonewalled them, and they didn't do anything about it when they were approached about what Gibeah had done. And instead, they kind of defended the Benjaminites instead of giving up the evil men at Gibeah who committed this crime. And they got into this war. Benjamin was winning for a while. It was kind of confusing until, you know, the tribes of Israel gave sacrifices and and everything. And then God delivered them. And they actually killed all but 600 men of Benjamin, which led us into the final chapter, Judges 21, where Israel kind of felt guilty after this war. They wiped them out, the 600 people. And they said, we can't kill our brother. We can't wipe out this entire tribe. And they were in this conundrum of how to give them wives. And they came up with all these elaborate tricks in their mind to why they weren't sinning because they created some vow about how they weren't going to give their, uh, why, their, their daughters to be the wives. So instead they came up with this trick where they'd be kidnapped from this dance at the Lord's you know, feast. It was really awful stuff. They were traveling through Shiloh to honor the Lord. And what, and what they had the Benjaminites do is kidnap the dancers uh, in Shiloh. This awful thing that was a sinful way to do it, but that's how they got around this. And they probably thought they were without sin because they came up with this whole trick. We won't take them from you. You won't give them to us and we'll all be good. Um, but that's how it happened. And that's how judges ended And it says, in those days, there was no king in Israel, and everybody did what was right in their own eyes. And that's pretty much what happened. And now we are in the book of Ruth. This is we're going to start now. Ruth 1. We'll jump right in. Now, this book says it it takes place right in the days of the judges. So the first line, it says, in the the days of the judges, there was a famine. So it's telling us right now, we believe it's near the end of the judges, the time near the end of the judges, only because the way the genealogies connect, and we know that it has to sync up like this, Somehow, but this is a pretty, they're pretty close, closely tied together generationally. So it couldn't have been too long before uh, things progressed further. But we are in now the time of the judges. So this takes, this book takes place. We're going to learn this little story. And it seems random until you know the connection to the messianic family again. The family that God was promising to bring Messiah. That's what this is all about, preserving that bloodline. We're going to see that story here and even Jesus Christ's story hiding in here. So in those days, the judges, there was a famine. Famines in the land, in the the land of Bethlehem, which is ironic because Bethlehem means house of bread, by the way. So in the house of bread, the storage was empty. There's no food, right? How ironic. Uh, But this usually meant when a famine came in the Bible, it was because, and Deuteronomy even talks about this, they had turned from the Lord. And we saw in the book of Judges, this is very obvious, they turned from the Lord. So God's way to deal with that sometimes is to send a famine. So we see that God sends a famine on Bethlehem, in the house of bread, they have no bread there. And a man of Bethlehem, from the place where there's a famine in Judah, 
And so we're seeing that connection again, Bethlehem and Judah. They sojourned in Moab. Sojourning means that you're going to go on a trip, but you're gonna, you intend to come home. That's what sojourning is. It's a journey where you tend to come back. So he went to Moab, which means that we had to cross the Jordan River and leave the promised land. And he left with his wife and his two sons. And we learned that his name is Elimelech. And he's one of the characters here. Elimelech takes him, his wife and his two sons, right? And his wife's name is Naomi. And she's a main, one of the main characters in this book here. So Naomi and their two sons, Malon and Kilion. So Naomi, her husband, and her two sons leave to Moab. First, this is a wrong move, although it looks like, you know, yeah, there's a famine. They're trying to go. There's food. It looks good and all, right? But really what they're doing here, if you think about it, they're leaving the promised land that God promised them to go to a Gentile nation. And not only that, remember in the beginning in Judges, I said, the second judge, Ehud, who did he defeat? The Moabites. He killed King Eglon and the Moabites. So these people are adversarial to Israel. They don't really get along too well. And they, they are going to Moab. They're going to a Gentile nation to try to survive. So Elimelech, it says, ended up you know, staying in Moab. And the key, that's important because he didn't intend to stay. He was sojourning, but he ends up staying there. And again, this can kind of happen too, where you say, oh, I'm just going to kind of do this once, to sin one time, and then I'm going to come right back and be godly. And instead, you see him slip right into, you know, they end up staying in Moab, and Elimelech dies, it says. So now it's Naomi and her two sons. Uh, living in Moab. And it says then that her two sons, Malon and Kilion, took two Moabite wives, and their names were Orpah and Ruth. Orpah and Ruth were the two names, so now we see that they're, they're marrying uh, Moabite women. This is a problem because, again, this is another violation of God's law. God told the Israelites to marry inside of Israel, right? They're mixing with the Gentile nations, and the problem was, don't marry into the Gentile nations. Don't marry them in because they're going to get you to follow their gods. It doesn't even matter if they agree to follow Yahweh. Yahweh's saying if they agree to follow me, but they follow their other gods, that's still idolatry. So he warned them about this, but it happens anyway. And, and good will come out of it later, but right now we're seeing more and more sin. It's the time of the judges, so it only makes sense. But it says they lived there for about 10 years. So a full decade they lived there. And then, of course, uh, we learned that Malon and Kilion died. So this story starts out pretty depressing. And we're actually going to see, though, it's kind of beautiful in a way. This book goes from death to life. So it kind of gets old, and it starts out negative, but it only really gets better, okay? And that's kind of the story. Again, we're going to look at that. That's the story of humanity, right? story of humanity, the Bible starts out with death, right, in the garden. And death, and, and, and it's evil and awful, but it progresses to, to Jesus Christ, to life. We go from death to life. So that's what this book here in Ruth is going to show. It starts out with death. And now Naomi is left with her two daughters-in-law. So it's Orpah, Ruth, and Naomi. And the sad part, the problem here, now that Ruth is, or Naomi is widowed and Ruth's widowed and Mal or and uh, Orpah's widowed, they are now the lowest in society. It's one of the lowest groups in society. They had nobody to take care of them. That's what the men did. They had nobody to provide for them. And they pretty much had to, you know, go on the welfare system, essentially, of, that, of the times that we'll learn about the law of gleaning. They'll tap into here. But they just pretty much had to go on handouts, whatever people would help them with. They were very poor and downtrodden people. So they were in a very, very bad state. So, so Naomi, it says in the meantime, had heard in the fields of Moab, where they probably worked, that the Lord had visited his people back in Bethlehem and had given them food. So she had learned that, remember, the, whole t the reason they sold their land and left 10 years ago was because of the famine. Well, now the Lord <clears throat> has lifted the famine, she hears. So she went back toward Judah with the two women, Orpah and Ruth. And Naomi tells them to return to their mother's house. She says, you guys go back. We're, you know, this is terrible. You guys are still young. May the Lord deal kindly. She starts speaking blessings on them, saying they dealt so well with her dead sons, and they dealt so well with her. God, you know, bless them. Um, but you guys should really go back to, you know, go back to your mother's house and find husbands, she tells them, because they're still young. And they have a future ahead of them. They don't have to live in this poor, miserable state. But Naomi, you know, she, she kisses them, and we, she's getting old, so she's really downtrodden. And see, Naomi kisses them, and they lift up their voices and weep together. They're all sad in this entire state as she's telling them to go home. So Orpah and Ruth both tell Naomi they'll come with her. So at first, Orpah and Ruth are saying, no, 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 we're going to come with you. We're not staying in Moab. And Naomi asks, well, why would you come with me? They have this little dialogue. She says, why would you agree to come with me? I have no sons in my womb. So she's saying, I'm not pregnant. I don't have any future men for you to marry, 
which is a Levite marriage we're going to learn about here in this, in this book too. A Levite marriage, there was a law back in the, in the Bible, in the, in the book of the law, that said that if a man died uh, and, his, and his wife could still have children, he didn't have any children yet, which Malon and Kilion did not have any children, that somebody else in the family bloodline, a man, could rise up and have children to carry on that man's name, that man's legacy, to continue it on. So that was a Levite marriage. So she's saying here, I don't have any kids for this Levite marriage, and I'm too old for a husband, so I'm, I don't really have anything. And, and even if I did have children, would you wait, you know, years and years for them to grow up? That would, you know, be wasting your life. Would you guys really refrain from marrying other men? What would be the point of it? She says, just go back to Moab. You guys are great and all, but uh, this just doesn't make sense. And they lifted their voices and wept again. So you can see this very an emotional exchange at, because they loved each other. You can see they're emotional because they loved each other. Orpah, Ruth, everybody's crying. So you can say they all really loved each other. Um, and it says that Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. So she kisses her goodbye. And again, Orpah's kissing her. So it's showing the kiss. There's some love there. It's not like Orpah's abandoning her. Naomi has told her to go back. Orpah originally tried not to. Then she was talked into it. She cries and she leaves. She kisses her. But it says that Ruth clings to Naomi. And this is beautiful. Ruth, instead of leaving, clings to her, gets closer and says that, uh, you know, Naomi points out, well, Orpah, you know, Orpah's gone back to Moab. Why don't you go with her? Go back. Like, Ruth, what are you doing? And Ruth says, you know what? You know, I love you, Naomi. I'm going to be with you thick and thin here. Your people are going to be my people back in Israel. And, you know, your God will be my God, right? So she's even giving up her gods here. This is a, this is a great thing because Ruth here is a Gentile woman. She was a Moabite that probably was a worshiper, at least at one point, if not now, of Kamash. Kamash was one of the big gods, one of the main gods of the people of Moab. But Naomi, Naomi again told Ruth, you know, to go with Orpah. But Ruth, Ruth says, don't urge me to leave. You know, her people are going to be my people. And she says that, you know, when she die, you know, where you die, I'll die. She's really committing to this. And uh, Naomi saw it, says that she was determined and asked her to stop no more. She realized there's nothing she's going to say to her to go. And she was thankful um, and just agrees that Ruth and Naomi are going to be, or they're going to go back to the land of Judah together. So Naomi and Ruth, it says, come to Bethlehem. And as you can imagine, think about it. It's been 10 years. Imagine if you lived, wherever you lived right now, you left. You sold your house. You sold your property for 10 years, right? Without a trace, because back then they didn't have cell phones, Facebook, social media, phone calls, really. You couldn't keep in touch with your friends from a distance, right? So Naomi had been gone for 10 years. They didn't really know Ruth because Ruth was from Moab. But Naomi had been gone for 10 years. They hadn't heard from her, hadn't heard or seen a word from her. And she shows back up 10 years later in town. They said, whoa. You know, it says the whole town was stirred. You can imagine if you hadn't heard from anybody, you haven't seen anybody. And they said, is that Naomi? Is that her? It's been 10 years. She probably changed a little bit, got a little bit older, but they could tell it was Naomi. And Naomi says to them, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. And Mara means bitter, right? But before, Naomi means pleasant. So Naomi shows that she was pleasant and she became bitter. She changes her name on her own. She says, call me Mara. I want to be called Mara because the Almighty God has dealt bitterly with me. Basically saying, he took my, he took my husband, he took my two sons, God doesn't love me. God, you know, he's, he's, he's angry with me. He's dealt bitter with me. Call me Mara. My life is bitter. The best part about this, though, is you never see her called Mara at all in this book by anybody. And I think that's a lesson to us that says we can identify ourselves as our terrible state in our lives, our s situation, but God will decide who we are, and he decides our future. And he, he knew that Naomi was not going to have a bitter future. She had hope. And it was going to be pleasant. So he never has anybody call her Mara. He never calls her Mara. She's called Naomi throughout the entire book. We see it here. She wants to be called bitter, but that's her own little pity party. God, that's not God's plan for her, right? So we don't pick our, our sad identities. God gives us an identity of hope in Jesus Christ. And we're seeing that pattern even here. So it says that Naomi then went, went away. Uh, it says full and came back empty. She's telling them how, she, how terrible it was. Why should they call her pleasant? Why should they call her Naomi? And then it says to end the chapter, it says, these are always clincher. These are always key. It says, it was the beginning of the barley harvest. And that's how the chapter kind of ends. So we know right there when it just kind of transitions into something like that, that's going to be important. And we know as this goes, this is very important. Barley harvest was a very busy time. And that's when this is their agricultural season, when they're going to go out and cultivate it. And it was a whole process. So it's going to lead us kind of in uh, to the next part of the story. But that is Ruth chapter one. 
where we get introduced to the, the, the whole situation of Elimelech, his two sons, Malon and Kilion, and how they died and left Naomi, Orpah, and Ruth. Does anybody uh, have any questions or comments? And remember, if you're online, it doesn't matter if you're not in the room with us. You are in the room with us just through the camera here, um, but you can still type in. You can ask any questions, type in any comments that you want to share. And we have Phil over here that will be glad to ask for you uh, or share with us. And, of course, if you're in the room and have any comments or questions. Yeah, Phil. Wow, yeah. That's awesome. So Phil, for, if you can't hear online, Phil says, it was a great comment. He says how it loves, kind of what I said there, how it loves, he loves how it ends with the barley harvest. And it's a good connection, what Phil made there. There's so many connections, so many things to be seen in God's word, we can never get to the bottom of it. Here's another great point, he says, remember, remember there was a famine. So there was probably not many barley harvests at all when, they, when the last time she was there. She went to Moab, and then she heard in the field, remember she heard by, you know, almost by rumor in a way, but it was a true thing, right? She heard through the fields that God had blessed them again. And we see right at the end here, she's going back to the beginning of the barley harvest. So it's showing that what she heard was true and God had blessed the land. And we're going to see how that blessing is going to play right into uh, her future and her life. Any other comments or questions or thoughts? Yeah, Mike. It's all right. There's no spoiler alerts. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. So that's a, that's an all the way all the way down to the tenth generation. Yeah, which is a pretty. I don't know if you know the tenth generation out what it comes out to or not when you count it out. So the, so if you the, the, right even in there if you look at there's a bit of a prophecy there of the pattern of when the curse happened that will lead right I believe into uh, David. So he'll be the tenth line because what had happened with Ammon and Moab. So the, where this comes from, he finds a really key point. So, so uh, Orpah and Ruth were Moabites. So Ruth, that means, can't come in to the godly place. They were not allowed in. So it's showing how Ruth was an outsider. That even though she came into Yahweh, even if she marries in, they're not allowed in the presence because of their origin. Now, their origin goes back to Lot. So there was an awful wicked story about how Lot had his, he had two daughters, and, and they ended up, you know, having, you know, they, they got him drunk, and they ended up having children with him. And those children were Ammon uh, and Moab. So that's where the whole bloodline came from. And it's tied in to that God was never going to let this, you know, this bloodline ever enter his household. And it, it had come to be from Lot basically being, you know, somewhat raped by his daughters. It's an awful story. But there's this whole pattern of the tenth, until the 10th generation. But if you follow the pattern, I believe it falls right onto David as breaking it. So it's showing that after 10 generations, they were allowed in. So it's really cool when you start to look into these things, how they play in there. Perez, that's it, yeah. And Perez, and an and interesting thing, Perez there too, he, he <laughs> same situation, he ended up sleeping with his daughter-in-law tomorrow, another weird situation. And that was based off a Leverite marriage, which ties right, in, ties right into this, so, which is awesome. The Leverite marriage, again, was to continue uh, the generation. And we learn that Judah, Judah was the one that had Perez with Tamar, Judah which again, that, that is the whole bloodline. The whole bloodline here that was going to get the scepter was Judah. And it was Judah himself who was the father of Perez. And if you count the 10 generations from Perez down, you get right, you get right into it there. So yeah, great, great point. And you're going to see again, that's a really import, important thing. They'll mention Perez here because it's showing that there's the Leverite marriage is going to come right back into play here is what we're going to see here uh, with Boaz and Ruth. So any other questions or comments? Yeah, Gail. Yes. I have written in here that bitterness will always blind us from mm. the amazing things of God. Amen. Mm -hmm. God gave us a picture right. of the basket that he gave to us to hold that. And we have taken it for a blind eye. Yeah. And so far, we see the fruit. Amen. I love it. Yeah, because we bitter. Yeah, bitterness. That's not how God sees us, and the bitterness we shouldn't cling on to that because God has so much for us. That's a beautiful reminder again. And God never recognized. That's what I love. Naomi could call herself Mara all she wanted, but that's not how God recognized her. He recognized her 
as Naomi, as, as pleasant, because that's, that's how God sees us. God sees us as his children, right? He sees us as heirs to Christ's throne. He doesn't see us as sinners. So we can say we are sinners. We are sinners, but that's not our identity. We don't say, hey, my name's Eric, and I'm a sinner. No, it's, hey, I'm Eric, and I'm a child of God. That's a very different statement. I'm a child of God, and I am a sinner. I do sin, but I'm actually my identity is child of God. It's not a sinner. And Naomi kind of identified herself with her negative situation in life, which we all can have negative situations, but it's to identify with God's promises. Again, why God's word is so powerful. So that's a great, great point. Howard, did you have a question or comment? Wow. So how this is another beautiful God, like you can tie Jesus Christ's story throughout this, ent- this entire Bible. There's a whole pattern that's showing us this. And Ruth and, and the story in Ruth here, Howard's connecting it to in John when, you know, Jesus says, you know, he starts thinking about his flesh and his blood and all this stuff. And he allows, there's a bunch, remember, Jesus had disciples, not just the 12. He had hundreds of disciples. That meant anybody who followed him. And he had crowds that followed him. But Howard said, Howard made a good point that they were, you know, he, Jesus did the same thing, says, hey, you know, you guys can all go ahead and leave. And just like Orpah and Ruth here, Orpah, you know, was with Naomi, just like those disciples were originally with Jesus, right? They were all with Jesus until it says, no, you can go. And the ones that stayed, like he said, is Peter and the other 11. Those, those 12 disciples were able to, they, 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 they chose to stay. So you're seeing that here again, Naomi's faithfulness. Uh, and it's beautiful too, because she's a Gentile again, which gives us hope, a Gentile, you know, being able to, to choose to come into God's family and sticking with God and how, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to see that Orpah is even so, like some believers who, you know, at first are in and then eventually kind of walk away. Not that Orpah was sinful so much here because Naomi kind of commanded her, but it's also another pattern that shows, uh, there, and I, I'm sure you guys can think of people who called themselves believers in your past life, past where you guys would worship together and for a while you walk with God and then you're still walking with God, but they kind of went back to Moab. They kind of went back to their Gentile worldly ways. It happens a lot where people will fall away. And this kind of showing here again, and we're going to see Ruth will be blessed for following Yahweh, choosing Yahweh. We don't learn about Orpah, but I can't imagine she was blessed for worshiping Kamash and the gods, right? So it's, it's kind of the two things. You can choose God or you, you can't. You can choose God and be blessed or not and not have as great of a life because Moab's kind of a problem for Israel. So these are great, great comments and questions, by the way. Anybody else uh, have any thoughts? All right, with that said, we're going to go ahead right into Ruth chapter 2, finish out our study for this week. So in Ruth chapter 2, it now shifts where Ruth is going to meet Boaz, who is our main character, uh, one of our main characters in the story. And the reason being is we're going to learn here that Boaz is part of the bloodline. So Boaz is a quote-unquote father of Jesus Christ. You know, his fathers and his ancestors, Boaz is a father of Jesus Christ in a way, generations ahead of time. So that's why this story is so important. The book of Ruth here, it's four chapters, and it's probably like, why? Some of you guys are probably wondering, you know, why are all these books, all these thick chapters and all this stuff? Then the book of Ruth, this little short mini book slammed right in here, all these other long books. There's reason to it. It's, it's going to connect us to Boaz and Jesus Christ's bloodline and show how, again, you know, it, Satan was probably, you know, he's, the enemy was probably glad when they see the bloodline almost fizzle out because Satan's strategy is to destroy God's promises, which is impossible, by the way. But he continually, him and the demons and the evil spirits, the evil gods, they try to ruin Yahweh's plan, but they, they can't. But this, again, we're going to see is how the bloodline was in danger, and God, through miraculous ways, saves it through. We're going to learn here, so it's beautiful. So Naomi, um, it starts out, says she had a, re- a relative in Elimelech's family, and his name was Boaz. So right here, they're already thinking the law of the Leverite marriage. Like, oh, our, you know, the family line can still be continued. Because if not here, the bloodline would have died out and there would be no Jesus Christ. He wouldn't have been able to b- been born through this bloodline. This is why this is so important. So Ruth says to Naomi, well, I'll go, I'll go and glean some fields and to find favor, you know, to get to some food. And Naomi says, you know, go, my daughter. So they learn about Boaz. They kind of talk about it. And she goes, all right, well, I'm going to go try to find some favor. I'm going to go to glean some fields. 
You have to understand here another law from the ancient times. It's called the law of gleaning. And the law of gleaning is basically the ancient welfare system, okay? So what it was was it was a law that said that your reapers, and the reapers, you know, were the ones that would go out and glean the fields. They'd go out with their, you know, sickles and stuff and reap the harvest. They were allowed to only go through once. It was the law. You could only walk through your field one time with your reapers. Anything they missed, they couldn't find pick anything. Anything they missed was to be left to the widows, the orphans, and the destitute, okay? It's because they didn't have anybody to care for them. That's why I said that. Naomi and Ruth and Orpah in, in their situations, that's the reason Orpah went back is because if she didn't, th th they were going to stay in this awful state or so they thought because that's what society had, didn't have a lot. So this is kind of a welfare system. Ruth basically says, I'm going to go collect our welfare, you know, our food, our food for, for what's going to be, what, what I can find. And you were never promised to find anything. It was just you're able to go through and get the little bit you could. Um, so it says that she gleaned in the field after the reapers um, and it just happened to come to the field belonging to Boaz. And I love this. This is what sometimes in the science of the uh, uh, psychology field they'll call synchronicities. Synchronicities are when, you know, weird things happen where you say something and all of a sudden you hear it. Or you hear a song on the radio and then all of a sudden you see it on TV. These weird connections that seem like a coincidence, but there's something a little bit too weird. That's what a synchronicity is. They say it's something that it's, it's so improbable it shouldn't have happened. The fact that it happened, there's something deeper here. I'm sure in your own life you can think of weird situations where you're thinking of an old friend and then all of a sudden you walk into them in the grocery store, they're right there, something weird like that. It's a God-ordained appointment. And that's what we see right here. It was not an accident, although it looked in a human way that she just happened to go into this field of Boaz's, but we see that God has uh, chose to do this. So God is orchestrating this whole thing. And it says that Boaz came from Bethlehem. So here's the connection again, that Boaz uh, came from Bethlehem. This is the land uh, that, that where she came from. And this is, again, is the town where Jesus, uh, was born and David, there's a town of David and Jesus' birthplace. So we're seeing the family is surrounded by Bethlehem. This is kind of a hub here of activity that's going to go on in patterns for future generations. Kind of like a lot of people don't know this, but Abraham and Isaac, if you go back to that story and you, and you take Isaac to Mount Moriah, the precipice up at the top where he was to be sacrificed, where God spared him. That was actually right at Golgotha, where Jesus Christ's cross was really put there. So it was the same uh, location. You'll see that God uses the same locations literally on earth to do things. So you're seeing here, it's in Bethlehem. It's an important spot. And Boaz, you know, comes up upon his field. We see he says, you know, the Lord be with you and the reaper say with you. They kind of pass each other some blessings. And then Boaz says to the young man in charge of the reapers, like the boss of the fields there, says, who's this young woman I see? So we imagine that Ruth, she's, she's young here. She's probably a really pretty Moabite woman, and Boaz recognized her. And it says that the man that works there replied that she was a Moabite woman who returned with Naomi and ended up telling her story. Like, this is the woman that came back with Naomi from Bethlehem who left, and, you know, Elimelech, she married one of Elimelech's sons, probably tells the whole backstory here. And the man says that she even asked. So this is it's showing politeness and, and honor. Ruth, it was the law. She had the right to go into this field, but she actually asked. She was, it, was, it was showing a, a honor here. And she had asked to glean the fields. And it says that she actually continued from early morning all the way up until the current moment. And she only took a short rest in between. So it's showing her character. She's a hard worker. And she's out here working for her and her mother-in-law, Naomi. She's out here gleaning the fields, get all the food she can. She's working morning to night, showing great quality uh, from Ruth as a person. So Boaz says, uh, uh, Ruth tells her to not glean in other fields. Says, don't pass into any other fields, basically. I'm going to take care of you. You don't need to go field to field to field because you can imagine uh, you're gleaning fields after the reapers. You pick up a couple scraps. You might have to go to another field to get some more until you had a full you know, container that was going to feed you and, your, and, and, and who you needed in your family. So he says to keep close to his young women, the other women in his field, and Boaz tells the young men not to touch her. So right here, we're getting another cultural sign that Boaz kind of has the hots for Ruth. So he's like, hey, don't touch her. She's, you know, hands off. You can't, you know, you don't want anything like, like that going on. You're going to take care of her and you're going to protect her. Um, and it says that when she's thirsty, she should go drink the water that was drawn by the men. So he's even given her special privilege. She's supposed to be a widow that's destitute and out and, and out on her own kind of. And he's saying, you know what, I'm, you can have as much water, almost like me casa su casa. You know, my house is your house. If you want some water, just go get some. Whatever you want, you can have it. So he's really taking care of this Ruth. And Boaz knows the story. So Ruth falls on her face, it says which means that she's in humility. She's so thankful. And she says, why have I found favor in your eyes? She doesn't understand. 
You know, she says, I'm a foreigner. She's a foreigner, and she's surprised he even took notice to her. She's just a Moabite woman in Bethlehem here gleaning fields because she's a poor widow. But Boaz says, well, I heard, you know, I heard what you did for Naomi. That woman from Bethlehem, the Elimelech's wife, they left 10 years ago when the famine came. I heard what you did for her, how you left your own land, you left your own people, and you left for Israel, and you didn't even know a thing about us. You'd never known us before. And uh, Boaz, you know, asked her to, uh, to repay her and reward her and says, by, by the God of Israel, under whose wings you take refuge. She takes refuge. So he's even saying that he want the God of Israel, may the God of Israel bless you because you're taking refuge under the one true God, Yahweh, right? Yahweh is, is the one true God, and she's trusting in him by going with Naomi. The beautiful thing here is Boaz is going to be the one to be able to fulfill that blessing. He wishes a blessing upon her, and he's going to be the instrument that God uses to bless her. And Boaz might not even known that at the moment. So it says at mealtime, there's mealtime, Boaz invites her to come eat bread and dip morsel in the wine. So eating bread and wine. So right here we're seeing again connection to Christ, the, the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. You'll see the pattern of bread and wine. Every time you see that, you can think Jesus Christ's body and blood that was broken and poured out for you and for me. So you're seeing again, Boaz, his, he's again Jesus' bloodline. They're going to have somewhat of a communion here without knowing it, right? And, but she's invited to mealtime. So she's really getting taken care of. Imagine kind of think of somebody who's almost like kind of a homeless poor person that you'd invite and allow, give them food, water, invite them in for your family meals. He's really taking care of her. And it says that she ate until she was full and actually had leftovers. So that's how well she was taken care of. It wasn't like she had a, you know, a little bit. He gave her a full buffet, said as, as much as you want. And he gave her so much that she even had extra food, which we're going to see is important here. And when she rose to glean, she was getting ready to glean, Boaz said uh, to, to let her glean among the sheaves. And he told his men to even drop bundles of uh, grain for her to glean. So he's almost like rigging it for her. Like, hey, guys, when you go out there, I want you to you know, leave, leave some good stuff for her, but I'll, I also want you to drop some of your good stuff. I want you to leave her a lot. So he's kind of really taking care of her. She's not just going to be gleaning. She's getting kind of a rigged setup here. She's getting taken care of. He's going to leave her extra on purpose, right? So this is, a, this is a pretty cool thing. Boaz is just really showing honor and love. And again, it's Jesus' bloodline, so he's kind of a typical uh, the type of Christ. What I mean by that is he has, he has Christ-like qualities. He's a shadow of what Christ uh, does here. And it's showing that you know us as foreigners, we were enemies of God before we were saved, before we believed in Jesus Christ. We were enemies of him, and he still loved us and shed his blood and took care of us, right? So you're seeing Boaz here showing Christ-likeness before Christ came to actually live in the flesh here, that he's loving a foreign woman, taking care of her, although, you know, she's far from being an Israelite, right? She's just chosen to follow. So it says that Ruth gleaned until the evening, again, working day and night. She's a hard worker. Uh, and beat out about an ephah of barley. This is a very giant collection of barley. And it says that Ruth took it into the city to Naomi, and Naomi saw the grain. And we believe that this was a sign of Boaz that he was going to take care of her, that, that Naomi shouldn't worry. When Naomi saw all this grain come in, it was a sign that, wh where, did you, you know, like, where did you get this stuff? Because Ruth came in not only with barley, but extra food. It's like, hey, I have leftovers. I just had a great meal you know, at this house with Boaz, and uh, I even brought you some food. Here's a, here's a plate. Here's a leftover plate. And all this food. So Naomi saw there was a sign here that they were being blessed by the Lord. And somebody was blessing them. So Naomi was asking where she was gleaning uh, and noticed the blessing. Ruth told her that the name's man was Boaz. Says, uh, you know, it was a man named Boaz. And Naomi says, hey, that's the, you know, there's a close relative of Elimelech. And he's actually one of our redeemers. Again, key term here, kinsman redeemer. He was, Boaz was called a kinsman redeemer. This goes back to, um, the concept where he could marry the woman and actually buy, it's a law of redemption, okay? The law of redemption, and this is very important. This book is so powerful to understand the book of Revelation chapter five. Revelation five is when the seventh seal is open and the deed of earth is there and John cries because nobody can open, redeem the earth and Jesus is the only one that can redeem it. He is our kinsman redeemer. He redeemed the earth for us. He redeemed our land for us. So Boaz is a Christ-like type here where he redeems the land for Noah, Naomi. Naomi says he's one of our redeemers, right? And this is why Christ is called our redeemer. He's redeemed what's been lost. He's given us the earth back. He's given our life back. And that's what, that's what this story here is showing us. So this is a parallel. Revelation 5, if you read it after reading the book of Ruth, you're really going to understand 
Boaz was playing out Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation, restoring the earth, restoring land uh, to him. Because remember, Naomi and her family left. They sold the land. But how it worked is God, the Israelites saw that God owned Israel. No tribe really owned it. They leased it from God, kind of. So when they sold the land, they just sold kind of the rights to it or the, the, to lease it. And at the, end of, you know, at the uh, end of the 50 years, or somebody could come and redeem it. And that's what they were talking about here, where they were going to be able to get Naomi land back that she had with Elimelech. They were going to redeem that land that was lost and sold. So Ruth tells her that Boaz you know, said she has to stay with the young men until they finish the harvest, kind of explaining the whole situation. And Naomi says it's good she's able to be in his field um, and says, you know, you'd be assaulted in others. So not only was Boaz taking care of her, but widows, because they were unprotected, they had no men to take care of them, they were also abused and assaulted, so it was dangerous out there. So she's being protected physically, food-wise. She's being protected and taken care of in every way by Boaz. <clears throat> so it says uh, that Ruth kept close to the young women of Boaz, and she would glean until the end of the barley and the wheat harvest, and Ruth lived with her mother-in-law. That's kind of how it ends. Again, it's talking about how she gleaned at the end of the barley and the wheat harvest, which is going to take us into the next chapter for next week as we get to that, and that she lived with her mother-in-law. So right now, Boaz is taking care of her. She's going into the fields. It's not like they're really poor. They're supposed to be poor in the widow's way, right? But Boaz is really showing her great welfare. He's really taking care of her. Um, so she's, they're getting their food, um, and they're getting, you know, they can kind of already see that they have this, they're going to see this plan come out where Boaz is going to be the redeemer. The plot is starting to thicken. They've come back to Bethlehem. It's been blessed with, with the grain. Although they should be poor, God is blessing them. With, she just happens to coincidentally run into Boaz. Remember, it's a divine appointment. We saw God divinely appoint this, and we're seeing Boaz play out a Jesus Christ type of love uh, for Ruth and Naomi. And this is kind of where it sets up now to where they're still widows. They're still not everything's right. They still don't have their land back. But she lived with Naomi, and Ruth and Naomi are being taken care of. Now they're being fed. And that's where Ruth chapter 2 ends. And that's where we'll end uh, tonight. But before we go on, does anybody have any questions or thoughts or comments, remember, online or even in the room here, about Ruth chapter 2 or something else in the Bible that it made you think of or any other thoughts or comments when you were reading? Yeah, Phil. So, Phil, that's a great point. Phil makes the comment that you see Boaz in his high status being lowly and loving and gracious and merciful. And Phil makes a good point. I'm sure Ruth wasn't the only, Ruth and Naomi were not the only widows in the town. This is a common thing. The fact there was a law of gleaning meant this is a common thing. You know, even Jesus said, you're always going to have the poor. You're always going to have the people in poverty and stuff. Uh, you know, he was, he was making that claim. It's because it's true. So there's probably plenty of people, but you see Boaz's love and mercy on this family. Um, and we'll actually know that Boaz, you can know that Boaz was probably one of the wealthiest landowners, actually. One of the wealthiest landowners there. And again, the king, probably like, he's not a king, but probably pretty high up in status. He was probably pretty wealthy, like Abraham was, like Solomon, you know, pretty wealthy. And again, playing out a Christ type of a person here. Somebody who had all the wealth, all the things they wanted. One of the highest ranking people, they, we probably think, as we go on, you'll see later, he goes to the city council at the gates. That was a big thing. Or the elders, basically the city council, would kind of hang out at the gates and make decisions. He was probably one of the high-ranking officials there in the city when he goes later and kind of negotiates. We're going to find out about that later on. But we see again, just like Jesus, how he is. He's one of the highest people with all the wealth he probably needed. But he's looking out for those lowly, those in need, those who are destitute, those who are poor. So he's showing again what Christ was going to do. is a shadow of what Christ was going to come to do to you and to I. Christ did not have to come down to earth. He didn't have to. He was seated high. He was in the heavenly places already, right? He was up there, God's God, and he's doing fine, but he loved us so much that he came down, it says, meaning he dropped into status to save us, right? And for what looked like for no reason, because we hated God, it says. We were enemies of God, but he made himself lowly to come down and to love on us, even though with his high status, and we see Boaz here in his high status, really looking out for uh, this family, which again, we're gonna, is going to lead into the birth of Christ by this bloodline. That's why it's such a powerful story. But any other? Yeah, Melissa. Yeah. 
Amen. Wow. Amen. She, she's pointing out here, Melissa points out that Ruth, you know, we see, you know, she was, it was awesome that she came with Naomi. That was honorable in itself and impressive that she left her land. But not only that, we're seeing, we saw it twice now, that she was a hard worker. She worked, for, worked from morning to night, and it says with very little break, very little rest. And even at the end there, she was working to the night. And I love what Melissa said here. She said that, you know, she could have just said, all right, I found this favor with this guy, the rich guy, Boaz. He's really taking care of us. I can kind of sit back in my laurels, just kind of take it easy, go idle. Uh, and it actually says, you know, in, even in the, in the Bible, it talks later on about, you know, the qualifications for widows to be 60 or older because young ones might not work and be more of gossip. So we could have seen Ruth do that. She could have become a gossip widow who was taken care of. But no, she shows true good quality, good character that she worked hard day and night for her food and not only for herself, but to take, take care of Naomi, who was elderly. So we're seeing Ruth being an honorable woman. She could have stayed in Moab. She could have remarried. And then here she's taking care of. She could have taken it easy. But we see her driving dedication. She has great character, uh, which, is, which is honorable to God and maybe why God, God called her. So that's a great, great point. Any other thoughts or comments or questions? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, right, right, yeah. Good or bad, right? Or bad. And rep a, and reputations, you know, can be good or bad. And sometimes they're true, sometimes they're not true, right? Uh, but here we're finding out the reputation was true, and it's it's great. Boaz says, like, you know, who's this woman? This woman's pretty, you know, who is this? And the guy kind of, you know, says, oh, this is the one about Naomi. And this must have been a big story about when Naomi came back and everybody's heads were turning. And he sees her reputation was what did it. Although she was probably pretty, but there's probably other beautiful widows, right, throughout the play that he could have taken at any time. But he sees her, but he notices it's her character and her reputation of how honorable she was. And then he sees it play out because he grants her. He hears about her reputation of being a hard worker, being dedicated. And then uh, she, even after the blessing, it says that she still worked hard. So, But it's her reputation, and reputations can be good or bad. Uh, but a good reputation and being constantly loving, that can, that can follow you here. And we're seeing that happen with Ruth, uh, which is God ordained this whole thing, which is it's a beautiful story uh, throughout the book of Ruth here. So, yeah, Gail. Nope. So we don't, so we don't know. It doesn't look like it, though. It does not look like he, uh, he had, we don't hear about, you know, a woman that died or a widow or anything like that. But at this time, it seems that he was just a wealthy, wealthy man. Um, it doesn't say anything. I'm, his characters always seem to be pretty positive here. So they always say you can always look at the character of the person and kind of basically even later on, we're going to look at there's a couple ways people can take things. If it was a sexual uh, encounter with Ruth or Boaz or not, you can make insinuations, but probably not because we see Boaz's character being honorable, which means he probably did not have a wife. He was probably a God fearing man, especially because he's a Jesus Christ type. He's a Christ type. And it's, you know, so we're seeing probably some purity here in Boaz. So he probably didn't have a wife, could have taken one the whole time, but God ordained it for it to be Ruth, to redeem this. Just like Christ, you know, redeems his bride. That's the church. So we're seeing that, you know, Boaz, again, being Christ, redeeming his bride um, through this marriage here. So we're seeing Boaz do that, playing out the Christ-like. And again, being right in Christ's family, it makes perfect sense. So that's a great, great question. Any other comments or thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Yep. But yeah, the the big the big thing there. Yeah, and wealth has all kinds of meaning. The big one here of wealth probably was to show that he had bountiful, you know, grain and harvest and whatever. But you can see his wealth goes further, and it's kind of like people like us. We might not be billionaires, but we have wealth. We have more wealth than most billionaires actually, uh, because they put things that you know you can measure wealth on worldly things or spiritual things. Spiritual things are the ones though measured on and I'm sure he had earthly wealth that we see here he does but he had spiritual wealth he was a godly man Boaz you'll see he'll honor he's honoring the you know the law of gleaning he's going above and beyond he's going to follow the law of redemption the law of the Levite marriage so Boaz is an honorable godly man which is obviously you can see he chooses God, God chooses to carry the bloodline through him but he had a there is you know physical wealth and spiritual wealth and spiritual wealth is always the one to really look out for in your own life to make sure you're spiritually wealthy and all you have to do for that is to have Christ in your life, Jesus Christ in your life, and you're wealthy, you have eternal life, uh, it, the Bible tells us. So, um, all right, do we have any questions or comments? So, before the tabernacle comes down, right? So, yes. Have this, like, the ark mm -hmm. the tabernacle. 
So for the so to when they'd have to go to so like so there'd be areas of worship, but yeah, to go to the, t- the tabernacle would have been in Shiloh. I believe the place to worship was Shiloh. That's why they went to Shiloh to kidnap those women back in the last chapter. But yeah, the, we are still at the tabernacle, and that's a great point. Tabernacle and temple co- themes are big too. Tabernacle is like a temporary tent. Temple is a permanent building. That's why our human bodies, our fallen bodies right now, are our tabernacles. They're our tents, the Bible says. And later on when we're glorified, we get our glorified bodies. Those will be our temples, right? Um, but we're also called, you know, the temple of God, too, to orchestrate that. But we are in our tents right now. And that's how Israel was. They would have to move around, move the tents around in the beginning of Exodus until they found, you know, until it comes later. Does anybody here remember who builds the temple? Anybody remember? Solomon. Yes, Solomon built the temple. But does anybody remember who requested to build the temple? David. There we go. So David wanted to build the temple, but God says, no, I'm going to have your son Solomon build it. And that, again, to show from temporary to permanency, which is another theme in the Bible. Like I said, we're in our tents. And the, in the New Testament, we even talk about our tents of our, of our bodies. And one day we'll get our actual you know, glorified temple that God will give us. So, But it's a beautiful, beautiful story here um, through the b- book of Ruth and the entire Bible. But with that said, thank you for joining us. We'll be here next week, uh, Wednesday night, 6.30 p.m. You can keep uh, tuning in here. You can watch it after the fact. Maybe that's why you're watching it. You'll be watching it later, watching it afterwards, or you can watch it live with us where you can comment. But we'll be finishing up the book of Ruth, Lord willing, Ruth chapter 3 and Ruth chapter 4. We're moving right on through the Bible. Uh, But keep studying your Bible, keep praying, and keep your lamps trimmed and burning. Make sure to like, make sure to share this for more people. Uh, Thanks again. We'll see you guys next week. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning.